The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio in six parts by Brian Gear, with music composed by Sidney Sager. The Moonstone, part five. I do not clearly remember anything immediately after the appalling discovery at the Shivering Sand. The discovery that the nightgown Rosanna Spearman had hidden in the tin trunk was my nightgown. My first proper recollection is of sitting with Gabriel Betteridge in his little room back at the house with a glass of grog before me on the table. Now, Mr Franklin, there's one thing certain. That's a liar to begin with, that nightgown. Betteridge, I know no more about taking the moonstone than you do, but there is the evidence against me. The paint on the nightgown and my name on the nightgown are facts. Take another sip of grog, Mr Franklin. You'll soon stop believing in facts. But I can't... No buts, Mr Franklin. Foul play. There's foul play somewhere in all this, and we must find it out. Now, what about the letter? Oh, good heavens, I'd forgotten all about it. Let's see now. There's pages of it. Is it from Rosanna? Uh, yes. Wait a minute. She came from a reformatory, didn't she? Hadn't she been a thief? And what if she had? Well, isn't it likely that she stole the moonstone? How do we know that she didn't purposely smear my nightgown with the paint? And then hide it so that no one could find it? <laughs> doesn't make sense, sir. No, no, you're right, it doesn't. Now, what does it say in the letter? The letter? Oh, yes. Let's see. Sir... I have something to tell you. Sometimes such misery may be told in very few words. In my case, in three words, I love you. In the name of heaven, Betteridge. Go on reading, sir. I couldn't tell you this if I didn't know that I would be dead by the time you read it. You will find the hiding place, and then you will find your nightgown with the paint on it. And you will want to know why I took the trouble to hide it. Well, the reason is in those same three words. Because I love you. Do you remember when you came out on us from among the sand hills that morning, looking for Mr Betteridge? I fell in love with you in that moment. You were like a prince in a fairy story. I suppose you'll laugh at this, but please don't. It's deadly serious to me. Oh, yes, I know all about the difference in our stations in life. And I know all about my deformed shoulder. But I know all about my heart, too. And that didn't lie. Neither did my tears at night. I cried because you never noticed me. Why should you? Except that I wanted you to. And of course I hated Miss Rachel. Oh, how I hated her. She used to give you roses to wear in your buttonhole, didn't she? Ah, oh, yes, but more often than not you wore my rose instead. I used to sneak in and put a rose in your glass of water and throw hers away. Anyway, about the diamond. As you know, Superintendent Seagrave began by setting a guard on all the women's bedrooms and we all chased after him to ask what he meant by it. We found him in Miss Rachel's sitting room. He pointed to the smear on the door and said, look at the damage we'd done already and sent us away again. Afterwards, I stopped a moment on one of the landings to see if I got the paint on my dress. While I was doing this, Penelope Betteridge came by. You needn't bother looking for paint on your skirts, Rosanna. Oh, why not? I was nearest the door just now, I think. So you may have been, but that paint's been dry for hours. If that policeman hadn't set a watch on our bedrooms, I might have told him so. What an insult! Thinking one of us might have stolen Miss Rachel's diamond makes my blood boil, it does. How can you be sure about the paint? What? After all, I suffered from the smell of Mr Franklin's blessed vehicle, which I had to mix up for him. Oh, there's nothing I don't know about it. Miss Rachel asked him if it would be dry in time for the dinner company to see it last night, and Mr Franklin said no, it wouldn't be dry for 12 hours. Well, it was just past three in the afternoon when they finished it. That means it was dry by three o'clock this morning, so none of us could have done it just now, could we? Perhaps some of the ladies did go upstairs to look at it last night, after all. Well, even if they did, that door was all right when I left Miss Rachel in bed at midnight. Shouldn't you tell the policeman, Penelope? I wouldn't tell him after the way he's treated us. Not if he paid me for it. So there. 
Then I went in to make your bed and put your room tidy. There was your nightgown lying over the bed where you'd thrown it. I picked it up to fold it and saw the paint from Miss Rachel's door. For a moment I was rooted to the spot. Then I ran with your nightgown to my room and locked the door and sat down to think what it meant. It meant you were in Miss Rachel's sitting room between midnight and three Thursday morning. That's what it meant. You can guess what I first thought, but I wasn't sure. For if you had been foolish enough to forget to take care of the wet door, Miss Rachel would never have let you carry away evidence like that against her. At the same time, I wasn't completely certain that I'd proved my suspicion to be wrong. So I decided to keep the nightgown, to see what use I could make of it. But of course it would be missed. There was only one thing for it. I'd have to make another nightgown exactly like it before Saturday when the laundry woman came. I locked your nightgown in my drawer and went back to your room to make sure there was no paint on any of your other things. There wasn't, except a few streaks on your flannel dressing gown, and I got rid of those by scraping them away. Later on, we were all questioned by Superintendent Seagrave, and Penelope came out of the room quite beside herself. That dreadful man thinks I did it. I know he does. Did what, Penelope? Stole Miss Rachel's diamond, of course. But why? Simply because I was the last one to be in her sitting room, where it was in the Indian cabinet. The very idea. I've been brought up with Miss Rachel from a girl. Oh, that dreadful man, he'll have me disgraced. I know he will. Then I thought, if the last person in the room is to be suspected, then the last person was you, Mr Franklin, and I hold the evidence. This seemed to open such a chance of bringing myself to your notice that I passed in a moment from suspecting to believing. And the reason you'd been so busy trying to help the police was simply to draw suspicion away from yourself. I saw my opportunity and I came down to you in the library. Yes, what is it? Excuse me, sir, but you left one of your rings upstairs and I brought it down to you. Oh, thank you, Spearman. Just leave it on the table there, would you? Yes, sir. Sir? Yes? This is a strange thing about the diamond, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is, indeed. They'll never find the diamond, will they? No, nor the person who took it. I'll answer for that. What are you talking about, girl? That made you look at me. And just then I heard Mr Betridge's step outside the door. That spoilt it all. I only just had time to get out of the room. When I got back to the servants' hall, the bell was going for dinner. Afternoon already, and the material for the new nightgown still to be got. I pretended I wasn't well and went to Frising Hall for the stuff. On the Friday morning, there was the new nightgown, all ready to go back in your drawer. And even its newness wouldn't give it away, because you'd had all new things when you got back from abroad. The next thing I heard was that the sergeant had come round by his own road to my opinion, that the owner of the stained article of dress was the thief. That left me holding the only proof against you, and not a living creature knew it. Not even you. Good heavens, Betridge, this is unbelievable. I didn't know any of this. Why should you, sir? There's no governing the human heart, is there? Now, who can that be? Come in. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon, Mr Betridge. I didn't know you were engaged. I've brought you the list for next week, that's all. Oh, thank you, Mr Jennings. Yes, I'll see to it. Uh, Would you care to join us in a glass of grog? No, thank you, Mr Betridge. I have some calls to make. Who was that, if I may ask? Ezra Jennings, Mr Candy's assistant. Candy? Candy? You remember, sir, the little doctor you had that argument with on Miss Rachel's birthday? Oh, yes. Told me I ought to go through a course of medicine if I was ever to get a good night's sleep again. You were rather sharp with him, sir. (laughs) So I was. He caught a severe chill going home in the storm. He was delirious for days. It left him just a shadow of his former self. And what's happened to his practice? Mr Jennings does it. The poor aren't fussy about who doctors them, and that's mostly all the practice is now. You don't seem to like him. No one likes him, sir. There's a story that Mr Candy took with him a very doubtful character. That list he left with you, what is it? Hmm? This? Oh, it's the sick people hereabouts who stand in need of a little wine. My lady always had a regular distribution of good, sound port and sherry among the infirm poor... And Miss Rachel wishes the custom to be kept up. Uh, Shall we go on with the letter, sir? Yes, but uh, you read it for a while, would you, Betteridge? Uh, Very well, sir. She'd made the nightgown. Uh, Go on from there. Yes, sir. 
Sergeant Cuff would be sure to examine all our linen and dresses. There was nowhere safe from him. For the time being, I decided... I decided to wear it under my dress. The next thing that happened, I was told to take the washing book to Sergeant Cuff. He looked at me as if I was a stranger, and he was very polite in thanking me for bringing the book. Both bad signs, I thought. Then it was time for you to come back from seeing Mr Godfrey off by the railway. I went to the shrubbery to try for another chance of speaking to you. But you never appeared, and what was worse, Sergeant Cuff and Mr Betteridge came along, and Sergeant Cuff saw me where I was hiding. I thought I'd better get back to work before any more disasters happened. Just as I was going to step across the path, you came back. You were making straight for the shrubbery when you saw me, and you turned away and went into the house. So I... No, I swear I didn't see her. I was going to take a walk in the shrubbery, but I remembered at that moment that my aunt might want to see me and change my mind, that's all. I went into the laundry room. It was empty, and I sat down to have a think. There was talk about your debts. Penelope had heard Miss Rachel talking about them. Mr Betridge spoke of them too. So it was plain enough that you'd stolen the diamond to raise money on it. Well, I could have told you of a man in London who would have given you plenty and no questions asked. Why didn't I speak to you about it? The truth is I lost my nerve the moment you looked at me. I'd gone as near as I dared when I spoke to you in the library. Then Penelope came into the laundry room and gave me something else to think about. Oh, I really don't know how I can put up with Miss Rachel's temper. I never knew her like this. Anyway, perhaps I won't have to much longer. Why is that? Oh, she says she can't bear the house with a policeman in it. And she's going to speak to my lady this evening and go to her Aunt Abel White's tomorrow. One thing's for sure. If she goes, so will Mr Franklin. You mean he'll go with her? Oh, no. It's him she's in a temper with. No, if Miss Rachel goes one way, Mr Franklin will go another. Unless they make it up before tomorrow. What have they quarrelled about, do you know? Oh, it's all on Miss Rachel's side. I'm afraid he's far too fond of her to quarrel with her. It's all Miss Rachel's temper, that's what it is. Then there came a message that all the indoor servants were to be questioned one by one by the sergeant. My turn came after the upper housemaid and my lady's maid. He tried to wrap it up, but I could tell that those two creatures had opened his eyes to some of the truth. He knew I'd made a new nightgown, but he thought it was my own. But what puzzled me was that he let me see, on purpose, I think, that he suspected me of having something to do with the loss of the diamond, but only as acting under somebody else's orders. But I couldn't think who that might be, and I still can't. One thing was plain. You were safe as long as the nightgown was safe, and not a moment longer. But at any second I might find myself charged on suspicion and searched accordingly. I had to choose between destroying the nightgown or finding a safe hiding place for it. I think if I had been less in love with you, I should have destroyed it. But how could I destroy the only thing which proved I'd saved you? So I thought of the shivering sand. It was never far from my thoughts, as Mr Betteridge knows. I made the first excuse that came into my head and got leave to go out for a breath of fresh air. I went straight to Mr Yolland's cottage at Cobb's Hole. His wife and daughter were the best friends I had. But don't think I told them your secret. I told nobody. I'm writing this letter up in Lucy's room, and I've taken off the nightgown. From Mr Yolland's beach combings, I shall take a small tin trunk to hide the nightgown in the sand. And then what? I must try and speak to you again. If you leave the house, as Penelope says you will, I shall have lost my chance forever. But if I miss you, or you are as cruel to me as you have been, then goodbye to life which has grudged me the happiness it gives to others. But it may not end like that. I may find you in a good humour tonight or tomorrow morning. Besides, I shan't improve my plain face by fretting, shall I? Who knows, but I might have filled all these pages for nothing. I beg to remain, sir, your true lover and humble servant, Rosanna Spearman. Oh, God, Betridge, that poor wretch. Don't upset yourself, sir. You didn't make her fall in love with you. The way she puts it, I almost feel I did. But when she thought I was cutting her, I swear I was only trying to help. You see, I, I thought Cuff suspected her, and glad though I'd have been to see his suspicions diverted from Rachel. Not at that cost. I just couldn't bring myself to stoop to that. 
That's why I kept on playing when she tried to speak to me in the billiard room. To help her. I thought she wanted to confess to some part in taking the diamond. Now, that would have been on the Friday night after she'd wrote the letter. Then the next morning, when she wanted to see me in the shrubbery walk, Cuff was trying to make me tell him what she'd said to me in the billiard room. So to warn her, I said loudly, I took no interest in Rosanna Spearman, and she misunderstood. It must have been that. That was the last straw. If only I'd let her speak. We'd have been at the point where we are now. And Rosanna Spearman might still be alive today. Take my advice, sir, and dismiss that thought from your mind. You still have to untangle yourself from this mess. Now, have you any plan? No, only to see Mr Bruff tonight and lay it all before him. Walk me to the station, Betteridge. There's a good chap. Betteridge, was I drunk the night of Rachel's birthday? You drunk? Why, it's your greatest defect of character, Mr Franklin, that you only drink with your dinner. Yes, but, <laughs> but that night... I might have had a drop too much. No, sir. I'll tell you what did happen. You looked so wretched ill, we persuaded you to have a drop of brandy and water to cheer you up a bit. Precisely. I'm, I'm not used to brandy and water. It's possible... No, that... sir, it isn't. I know you're not used to brandy and water, and to my eternal shame, I drowned half a glass of our 50-year-old cognac in a tumbler full of cold water. A baby couldn't have got drunk on what you had that night. I see. Well, what about this? You saw a great deal of me here when I was a boy. Did you ever know me to walk in my sleep? Never. Oh. Are you sure? Perfectly. You never walked in your sleep in your life. I see what you're driving at, but uh, it won't do. Why not? Well, suppose you did take the jewel when you were drunk or walking in your sleep or both together, if you like. Mm -hmm. That doesn't explain what's happened since. It doesn't explain how you took the jewel to London and pledged it to Mr Septimus Luca. Were you drunk or walking in your sleep when you did those two things? No, sir. The sooner you put your head together with Mr. Bruffs, the sooner you'll get an explanation for all this. We reached the station with only a minute or two to spare. Just as I was saying goodbye to Betteridge, I happened to glance towards the book and newspaper stall. There was Mr. Candy's assistant again. Our eyes met at the same moment. Ezra Jennings took off his hat to me and I returned the salute. I arrived in London far too late to see Mr Bruff at his office, so I drove straight to his home at Hampstead and disturbed him dozing in his chair, his bottle of wine at his elbow. He examined the nightgown which I'd brought with me and then read Rosanna Spearman's letter from beginning to end. In my opinion, this letter explains Rachel's extraordinary conduct. She believes you have stolen the moonstone. That had occurred to me, too. I just couldn't bear to believe it. The first thing to do is to appeal to Rachel. She must be persuaded, or forced if necessary, to tell us why she thinks you took the diamond. The chances are that the whole of this case will fall to pieces if only we can get Rachel to speak out. Do you really think so? Listen to me. Admittedly, this is your nightgown. And admittedly, it has a smear of paint on it from Rachel's door. But what evidence is there that you were the person wearing it the night Rachel's diamond was lost? Now, as to this letter of Rosanna Spearman's, it merely proves her to have been clever at deception. And that justifies me in suspecting her of not having told the whole truth. I won't start any theory. I will only say that if Rachel has suspected you on the evidence of the nightgown alone, the chances are that it was Rosanna who showed it to her. Because she hated Rachel. Because it would serve her purpose to stir up a quarrel between us. Exactly. She had not decided on destroying herself then, remember. But suppose it turns out that I did wear the nightgown. What then? Well, if that were to be proved, we'd have a job to prove you innocent of taking the moonstone. But we won't go into that now. We'll wait and see whether Rachel hasn't suspected you on the evidence of the nightgown only. Good God! What right has Rachel to suspect me on any evidence of being a thief? Sensible question. Rather hotly put, but worth considering, nonetheless. Search your memory and tell me this. Did anything happen while you were staying at the house to, uh, to uh, shake her belief in your principles generally? Mm, no, I, I don't think so. Frankly, and I know your affairs rather better than you do yourself. Did any of your debts turn up on the doorstep in Yorkshire? Yes. Yes, you're right, they did. I, I'd completely forgotten. There was a Frenchman who appeared just before Rachel's birthday. After money? <sighs> I'm afraid so. 
It turned into rather an ugly scene, and, and Aunt Julia and Rachel were in the next room and overheard. What it. happened? I'm ashamed to say that Aunt Julia paid the man what he wanted on the spot. Oh, it was an awful business. I was, well, rather tight for money as usual, and I'd borrowed some from a man who kept a small restaurant in Paris. When the time came, I couldn't pay it back. And meanwhile, he'd gone bankrupt and sent a relative of his to England to find me and get the money. What view of this did your Aunt Julia take? Oh, she was very annoyed with me for being so careless and putting myself in such a position. Then Rachel started on me. You know what high romantic principles she has. Said I was heartless and dishonourable. Not without some reason. I know. Well, things were rather cool between us for a while, but, but I made my peace with her the next day. I thought no more of it. Perhaps she remembered it when the diamond was lost. It would have had its effect on her mind. You may be sure of that. Hmm. Now then, Rachel must be our next step. But the great difficulty is going to be to get her to show her whole mind in the matter without reserve. Have you any suggestions to offer? I have made up my mind to speak to Rachel myself. You? Well, in cases of this extraordinary kind, the rash way is sometimes the best. And you have a chance in your favour which I don't possess... A chance in my favour. I don't trust your discretion and I don't trust your temper. But I do trust in Rachel preserving some perverse weakness for you. The question is, how are you to see her? May I venture to suggest, if nothing was said about me beforehand, that I might see her here? Cool. But may I? In plain English, my house is to be turned into a trap to catch Rachel, with a bait in the shape of my wife and daughter's. If you were anyone else than Franklin Blake, and if this matter were one atom less serious, I should refuse point blank. As it is, consider me your accomplice. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bruff. But when? Say the day after tomorrow. Stay at home all morning and expect me to call on you and tell you precisely when to be here. Two days later, as the clock of Hampstead Church struck three, I put the key into the door of Mr. Bruff's back garden wall... The garden was deserted. I went into the conservatory and crossed the small drawing room as Mr. Bruff had told me. Facing me was the door of the music room. At the other side of that door was Rachel. I own my courage almost failed me. My hands were trembling. I wanted to turn and run. So much depended on it. My good name, my future happiness. What would Rachel's reaction be? I began to feel all Mr. Bruff's doubts about the rightness of what I was doing. The moment I showed myself in the doorway, Rachel turned from the piano. She stood stock still looking at me. I took a few steps towards her and stopped. Slowly, as if in a dream, she advanced towards me. I forgot every consideration, past, present and future, which I was bound to remember. I caught her in my arms and covered her face with kisses. There was a moment when I thought the kisses were returned. Then, with a cry of horror, with a strength I could not have resisted, she pushed me away. Oh, you coward! You coward! I beg your pardon if I have offended you. How low can you sink? Only a coward would sneak in here and try and play upon my weakness for you. Perhaps. But you have done me an infamous wrong. I have done you a wrong. After what you have done, you can say that. Then you must be mad. You must be. No, Rachel, I am not mad. But you suspect me of stealing the moonstone. I've never known the reason why, and that is why I'm here today. Let me ask you this. Was it because Rosanna Spearman showed you my nightgown with a smear of paint on it? What on earth are you talking about? Rosanna Spearman showed me your nightgown? Of course she didn't. <sighs> why should she? Because my nightgown has come to light with that paint on it, and there seems every reason to believe that whoever was wearing it stole the moonstone. I've desperately clung to the hope that someone else wore it to throw suspicion onto me. So I ask you again, if it wasn't the nightgown, what made you suspect me? I don't suspect you. I know you stole the moonstone. Oh, Rachel, that is nonsense. I know I didn't. But I didn't, I tell you. And I tell you I saw you. I saw you steal the moonstone. What? You, you, you saw me? Yes. R Rachel, I... I can't explain the contradiction, but, but I swear before God that until now I did not know I had taken the moonstone. Do you believe me? I believe what I saw. Rachel, 
I want you to tell me everything that happened, from the time you wished me good night to the time you saw me take the diamond. Why go back to it? How can you go back to it? Because we are both the victim of some monstrous delusion that has worn the mask of truth. If we look at it together, if we look at what happened that night, we may end in understanding each other yet. Very well. What do you want to ask me? After we'd said good night, did you go to bed or did you sit up? I went to bed. Did you notice the time? Was it late? Not very. About midnight, I think. And did you go to sleep? No. I couldn't sleep that night. Oh. I was thinking of you. Was there a light in your room? No. Uh, yes. I got up again and lit my candle. And when was that? About one o'clock. I put on my dressing gown and I was going into my sitting room to get a book. I had just opened my bedroom door when I saw a light under the door from the landing and I heard footsteps coming towards it. I thought it was Mama. She tried to make me give her the diamond to look after for the night. I thought she was coming to see if I was awake and to speak to me about it. And what did you do? I blew out my candle. I wanted to keep my diamond. Ah, did you go back to bed? I had no chance. The minute I blew the light out, the sitting room door opened. And you came in carrying your bedroom candle. And what was I wearing? Your nightgown. Are you certain? Quite certain. Could you see my face? Yes, clearly. Were my eyes open or shut? Open. Was there anything strange about them? Were they fixed or staring? No. They were very bright, I remember, but quite normal. You looked about you as if you were afraid of being found where you ought not to have been. <sighs> but apart from that, there, there was nothing strange about me? No, nothing. So what did you do? I was petrified. I couldn't call out. I couldn't even move to shut my door. C could I see you where you were standing? You might have done, but you never looked towards me. Anyway, would you have taken the diamond if you had seen me there looking at you? The next thing to happen was that you went to my Indian cabinet. Then my back must have been towards you. How could you have seen my hands? There are three glasses in my sitting room. I could see your hands in one of them. You put your candle on top of the cabinet... And then you opened and shut one drawer after another until you came to the one with the moonstone in it. You looked at it for a moment and then put your hand in and took it. How can you be sure I really took the moonstone out of the drawer? I saw it gleaming in your fingers. There is no doubt you took the moonstone out of my cabinet. Did I close the drawer? No. The diamond was in your left hand. You took the candle in your right... And you stood still for what seemed a long time. I could see your face in the glass. You looked as though you were thinking and were dissatisfied with your thoughts. Then you seemed to rouse yourself and went straight out of the room. Did I close the door after me? No. Your light disappeared along the passage and the sound of your steps died away. And I was left alone in the dark. Did anything happen between then and the time when the whole house knew the moonstone was lost? No, nothing. Are you sure? Perhaps you fell asleep. I never slept. I didn't go back to bed. <sighs> Nothing happened until Penelope came in at the usual time in the morning. Have you anything else to ask me? <sighs> if you had spoken when you ought to have spoken, if only you, you had explained you yourself... You are unbelievable! I spare you when my heart is breaking. I screen you when my own character is at stake. And now you tell me I ought to have explained myself. What did you expect? That I should come to you and say, Franklin, dear, you are a thief. My love, you have stolen my diamond. I would rather have lost 50 diamonds than see your face lying to me as I see it lying but, now. Rachel, I, I'm sorry to have caused you this fresh pain. I, I think I'd better go now. No! It seems I owe you a justification of my conduct. Well, you shall have one. What I should have done, of course, was to raise the house and tell them what had happened. But I didn't do that thought and thought for hours. And then I wrote you a letter. But I didn't receive it. I any... know you didn't receive it. My letter said that I had reason to know you were in debt. There'd been that man from France, do you remember? Yes. And I remember how much it had disturbed you. So you would have known what I was referring to. And I also offered you the loan of as large a sum of money as I could get. I would even have pledged the moonstone myself if there had been no other way. And then... Just as I was going to arrange with Penelope to give you the letter, what do I hear? I hear that you, 
You had brought the police into it. You were busying yourself trying to find the diamond. You even had the audacity to speak to me about it when all the time the diamond was in your own hands. I could scarcely believe that you of all people could be so false and cunning. So I tore the letter up. But even then I hoped I could save you. Somebody told me you were on the terrace. I forced myself to go down. I forced myself to speak to you. Do you remember what I said? Perfectly. But you must believe me, Rachel, when I say that I did not know what you meant. It, it astonished me, it distressed me, but it didn't give me an inkling of the truth. That's just the expression you wore on your face then. Oh. How can you persist in this charade after all this time? This charade of injured innocence? But in my own eyes, I was innocent. <sighs> So how could I have understood what you were trying to say to me? Those, those veiled hints and suggestions did no more than make me uneasy about you. You should have spoken out. How dare you tell me what I should or should not have done? Is there no limit to your audacity? And besides, if I had spoken out in front of other people, you would have been disgraced for life. If I had spoken to you alone, you would have denied everything just as you're denying it now. I tell you, I shrank from the horror of it. You led me to expect we would understand each other after all this. Well, do we? Do we understand each other now? No, Rachel. It, it grieves me to say that we seem to be as far from understanding as we ever were. I had hoped for so much from this visit. I, I had hoped that everything would be set right again. How could it be? It's just where it was. You stole the diamond. You pretended to help the police. You pledged the diamond to the money lender in London and went abroad with the money. And now you come here and tell me what I should have done. There is only one thing I should have done. Only one thing I should do now, and that is to expose you and ruin you. But I can't. I couldn't then and I can't now. God knows why, but I can't bring myself to. I can't tear you out of my heart even now. I think I despise myself even more than I despise you. I had set out with the hope raised by Mr. Bruff that if only Rachel would tell what she knew, the whole case against me would fall to pieces. And what had happened? She had told me that with her own eyes she had seen me steal the moonstone. How was I to clear my name now? And until I had cleared it, what hope was there of my marrying Rachel? For I was certain of one thing, at least, that Rachel still loved me. Later that evening, I had a visit at my lodging from Mr. Bruff. I could hardly hold you entirely responsible for the shock and grief Rachel is suffering. After all, you saw her in my house with my permission. But I must insist that you give me your promise you will not try to see her a second time, except with my approval. I can assure you, Mr. Bruff, I'm in no hurry to repeat this afternoon's experience. You have my promise. Good. But I think we cannot be sure that Rachel has told you the whole truth. But we can hardly blame her for believing you to be guilty. Do you believe I am? No, not even on Rachel's evidence. Not even on the evidence of the night gown. I think there must be a dreadful mistake somewhere in all this. And somehow it must come to light. Oh, I wish I could feel so confident. Sergeant Cuff couldn't get at the truth. Neither, it seems, can I. Come, Franklin, you really must stop looking back to the past. We must close our minds to all that and see what we can discover in the future. But it is a matter of the past. Do you remember, Mr. Bruff, when we met over a year ago, just after my father had given me the moonstone to take to Rachel in Yorkshire? Aye, I do. Well, we wondered then why Colonel Herncastle had left the moonstone to Rachel. I don't think we need wonder any more. Is that your opinion? Isn't it yours? Can you possibly doubt that he meant it to cause trouble? He must have thought that the Indians would pursue it to Yorkshire and steal it, perhaps even killing people if anyone came between them and it. He must have. What he could not have known was that he would cause even greater harm, that he would turn a happy household into one of suspicion and mistrust. This final blow, that I, of all people, should take Rachel's diamond, that she should see me do it. Oh, that's a master stroke, that is. He could never in his wildest imaginings have dreamt of that. Franklin, you're allowing things to get out of proportion. Oh, it's only natural, I grant you, but listen to me for a moment. There's not the slightest ground for what you've suggested. Oh, come, Mr. Bruff. I repeat, Bruff. not the slightest basis in fact, and facts are what I deal in. But he knew the danger that followed him. He must have known that it would follow the Moonstone wherever it went. He thought he'd scotched the danger. He thought that by letting the Indians know the Moonstone would be cut into separate stones if he were killed, then he'd put pay to their pursuit. 
He could not have known how persistent they But he be. knew how persistent. I haven't pers finished. The only piece of factual evidence we have is the Colonel's will. You know yourself what he said in the clause relating to the monster? That he left it to Rachel in token of his forgiveness of her mother for closing her house against him in his life. That's a blatant lie. You know it is. Excuse me, Franklin, but I know nothing of the sort. Neither in words nor in writing did Colonel Herncastle give me any cause to suspect his motives. It may have been all the things in his lifetime that people said he was. I knew he collected occult books, took opium, dabbled in chemistry, kept the lowest society. But does that stop him repenting of his ways at the end? No, Franklin, there's no basis for your suspicions, none at all. Now let's stop looking to the past and concern ourselves with the future. I confess I see no future. Ah, Franklin, that's not like you. Come, I have a little plan. At least we agree that the Moonstone's at the bottom of all this now. What do we believe was done with the Moonstone when it was taken to London? It was pledged to Mr. Luca. Correct. And we know it was not you who pledged it. Do we know who did? Uh, no. And where do we believe the Moonstone to be now? With Mr. Luca's bankers. Exactly. Now observe. We are already in the month of June. Towards the end of the month, a year would have elapsed from the time when we believe the jewel to have been pledged, and there is a chance that the person who pawned it may redeem it. Now, under the terms of Mr. Luca's own arrangement, he himself must take the Moonstone out of the bank. So, I propose setting a watch at the bank to see if he does, and trying to discover to whom he returns it. That may lead us by a short road to who took it. What do you say to that? Very clever, Mr. Bruff. The only thing yeah. is... It means we've got to wait. About a fortnight. Is that so very long? It is when you're in my situation. I can understand that. But what else is left for you to try? I thought of talking to Sergeant Cuff. I'm afraid he won't help you. He's retired now. Betteridge has his address. I thought he might find the case interesting enough to help if he could. Perhaps. Keep me informed as to results. Meanwhile, I'll do what I can with my watch on the bank. But my inquiries produced only the information that Sergeant Cuff was in Ireland to look into some astonishing development in the art of rose growing. I wrote him a letter outlining the new developments and asking him to contact me upon his return. I then began to go over in my mind the events of the day leading up to my taking the diamond, in particular the dinner party. If only I could reconstruct those hours, I might begin to understand the events which happened later. It was useless to appeal a second time to Rachel. My aunt was dead. Mr. Bruff had been prevented from attending the dinner. That left Mr. Murthwaite, who was now a thousand miles away. Miss Clack, who was living in France for reasons of economy. Godfrey Abelwhite, whom I soon discovered to be travelling on the continent. And Mr. Candy. I remembered a letter I'd received from Betteridge a few days earlier, full of chatter but starved of news, except that Mr Candy, the physician, had heard from his assistant, Mr Jennings, that I'd been back to the locality, and that Mr Candy had expressed a wish to see me. I left for Yorkshire by the next train. I've often thought of you, Mr Blake, and if there's anything I can do for you, pray command my services, sir. Pray command my services. Very generous of you, Mr Candy. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is something... Very well, sir. Uh, Speak out. What is it? You remember, of course, the affair of the Indian diamond a year ago at Lady Verinder's? Diamond. Diamond. Oh, yes. Well, go on, go on. Uh, there now seems to be some chance that it may be found after all. Naturally, it would help if all the evidence could be collected again. I must say, I have some hope of discovering new evidence. Oh, evidence. That's what you're after. Oh, well... And I remembered that you had been one of the guests at Miss Verinder's birthday celebration. Don't see anything of her these days, bright little thing she was. Gone abroad, they say. Uh, no, Mr Candy, not abroad. She's staying in London with her guardian, Mrs Meridue. I knew a Meridue when I was a student. Not related, I suppose. This was a tall beanpole of a fellow. Came to grief over his gambling. Couldn't leave it alone. Lost his overcoat and all one night. Yes, Meridue. Related, do you think? You sent me a message by Gabriel Betteridge. You had something to say to me. Yes. Ye yes, Betteridge was quite right. I had something to say to you. Yes. Oh, what a wonderful man, Betteridge. At his age, what a memory. Was it by any chance about the dinner party? That's it, that's it. The dinner, the birthday dinner. Yes, the dinner. Perhaps you made a note in your diary of what you wanted to say. I require no notes, Mr Blake. I am not such a very old man yet, and my memory is thoroughly to be depended on. There's the dinner. 
It, it was a, a very pleasant dinner, was it not, Mr. Blake? A very pleasant dinner. I really had it on my mind to speak to you about it. I don't know when I ever spent such a pleasant evening among friends. Yes, come in, come in. Excuse me, Mr. Candy, but I'm just off on some calls. Is there anything you need? Oh, no, thank you, Mr. Jennings. This is Mr. Blake. Indeed, we are already acquainted. Uh, perhaps I may walk a little way with you, Mr. Jennings. It would be a pleasure, sir. Yes, a very pleasant dinner, Mr. Blake. Very pleasant indeed. I'm afraid you find Mr. Candy sadly changed. Yes, his illness must have been far more serious than I'd supposed. It's almost a miracle that he lived through it. Is his memory never any better? He's been trying to recollect something he wanted to tell me. Was it something that happened before he was taken ill? Yes, that is, it happened immediately before. Then I'm afraid it's most unlikely that he'll be able to recall it. Is it important to you? Yes, Mr. Jennings, it is. Can you... As a medical man yourself, can you suggest any way I might be able to assist his memory? Mr. Candy's memory is beyond the reach of any assistance. I know. I've tried often enough to help him remember. That's a very disappointing answer, I must confess. But it may not be a final one. It may still be possible to trace Mr. Candy's lost recollection. Really? But how? Before I come to that, I must tell you a little about his illness. You have heard how it happened, I dare say. It was after a dinner party at Lady Verinder's. He, he drove home in his gig and it was pouring with rain. That was the start of it. When he returned home, he found an urgent message waiting for him. And he went straight off to visit his patient without stopping to change his clothes. I was out myself on a case some way from Frizinghall. And by the time I got back the next morning, the mischief was done. The fever had set in. I sent at once to two other physicians to give me their opinion. They agreed with me that it was serious, but... Unfortunately, we differed over treatment. Eventually, they left the house and I managed the case alone. But obviously, your treatment was successful. Mr. Candy is alive today, it's true. It was successful to that extent. But it was not a rapid recovery. I sat by his bedside for days on end as he hovered between life and death. I wondered all the time if I'd done the right thing. It must have been an exhausting experience. It was. The only relief I had, though you may not think it a relief was to pass the time working on my book, on the brain and the nervous system. I'm sure you would have found it professionally most interesting. So will you, I think, Mr Blake. It has some bearing on Mr Candy's memory. For long periods, he was delirious. Now, it's part of my theory that although the power of speaking connectedly may be lost under such circumstances, the faculty of thinking connectedly is not necessarily impaired... Do you begin to see what I'm driving at? I think so, but, but how does it help me to discover what he was trying to tell me just now? I write shorthand, Mr Blake, and I use it to take down all Mr Candy's incoherent ramblings while he was in a state of delirium, night after night. And have you kept your notes? More than that. I have transcribed them into ordinary writing, and I think I've been able to fill in the gaps. It was rather like trying to put together a child's puzzle. I think it supported my theory... The superior faculty of thinking was going on in Mr Candy's mind while the inferior faculty of speech was in hopeless disorder. Did my name appear in any of this? There was one night when he seemed to be concerned with going over something which had happened between the two of you. Hmm. The question is, of course, is this the thing he was trying to remember when you saw him half an hour ago? It must be. Can't we go back and look at your papers, Mr Jennings? Forgive me, but it is not quite so simple as that. I am a physician... I cannot disclose what a patient of mine said when he was quite helpless and unable to act for himself. Not unless there's a very compelling reason for me to do so. Naturally, I understand your delicacy of feeling, Mr Jennings. My reason for wanting to know what Mr Candy was trying to remember is that later that night, the night on which he got soaked and caught his illness, a very valuable diamond was stolen from Miss Verinder's sitting room at the house. Now, there is some reason to hope that it might be recovered. And as a member of the family, I'm trying to collect every scrap of information about the events of that night. I am sorry to disappoint you, Mr Blake, but the information I have has nothing to do with a diamond. In fact, Mr Candy didn't say a word about diamonds the whole time he was ill. Now, if you will excuse me... Mr Jennings, I have not treated you quite fairly. The fact is that it's very painful to have to tell you the real reason for my interest. In a word, I took the diamond... You, Mr Blake? There seems to be no doubt about it, no doubt at all. Miss Verinder herself has told me that she saw me take the diamond. 
But why do you need to appeal to Miss Verinder? Surely you know yourself that you took it. No, Mr Jennings, I do not know. I'm sure that Miss Verinder is telling the truth, but I swear to you that I took the diamond without knowing it. Now do you see why it is so vital to me to find out every scrap of information? The least thing may provide some clue which will lead to unravelling the whole affair and clearing my name in Miss Verinder's eyes. Then Miss Verinder has not made her statement publicly? Of course not. I am going to ask you a question, Mr Blake. I want you to think carefully before you answer it, and I want you, for your own sake, to tell me the truth. You have my word. Very well. It is this. Have you ever taken opium, Mr Blake? Uh, opium? Good heavens, no. Why do you ask? Were your nerves out of order this time last year? Were you unusually restless and irritable? Why, yes, I was, now you mention it, but, but what has all this to do Did with... you sleep badly? Y yes, wretchedly, many nights I'd never slept at all. Was the birthday night an exception? Try and remember. Um... Did you sleep well on that one occasion? Uh, yes, I do remember. I slept marvellously well. Mr Blake, will you come back to the house with me? Can you spare me an hour of your time? Of course, but what are you driving at? The truth of what happened that night. It's in my notes. The notes I took off Mr Candy's delirious ravings. I can explain everything oh, for, for you. For God's sake, Mr Jennings, tell me now. No, not here, in the street. Besides, I need my notes. Come back to the house. But your calls. My calls can wait. Back to the house, Mr Blake. But what does all this mean? A, a page of writing with great gaps in it. Another page, part of it in red ink and the other part in black? How am I to make any sense of all this? You will, Mr Blake, in a moment. May I ask you a few more questions? By all means. You've already told me that you've never taken opium in your life, so far as you know. Of course not. You also told me that at this time last year you were irritable and sleeping badly, except on the night of the birthday. That's right. Can you think of any reason for this nervous irritability? No, none whatever. Oh, I remember old Betteridge had an idea about it, but it's of no importance. Well, pardon me, Mr Blake, but in a case like this, anything, however trivial, is worth mentioning. Why did Mr Betteridge think you were sleeping badly? Because I'd stopped smoking suddenly. Miss Verinder said the smell of it offended her. Hmm. And had you been an habitual smoker? Oh, yes, I enjoy my cigar, and I didn't find it easy to give up. Then Mr Betteridge was perfectly right. You were an habitual smoker... You suddenly stop smoking, yes. and your nervous system suffers as a result. Of course you couldn't sleep at night. Now, do you remember getting into an argument with Mr Candy about medicine, either at dinner or afterwards? Yes. I'm afraid I was rather rude to him about his profession, but we parted on good terms at the end of the evening. May we turn to these papers? There's one more thing I should like to know. Were you particularly worried about the diamond at the time of the birthday? I had every reason to believe that there was a plot to steal it, and I rather thought that some attempt would be made that very night. Ah. There was also the question of Rachel's... of Miss Verinder's personal safety. She was wearing it in her dress. Did you talk about the diamond before you went to bed? Uh, Lady Verinder tried to persuade her daughter to give her the diamond for safekeeping. I overheard that conversation, yes. But, Mr Jennings, tell me what you suspect. I would rather you found out for yourself. Try the papers now. Begin with this one. Mm -hmm. This is a transcription of my shorthand notes of Mr Candy's speech while he was delirious. Mr Franklin Blake and agreeable down a peg medicine Mr Jennings, I'm at my wit's end. You, you play with me. What does all this mean? Go on to the other sheet of paper. You must understand that the fragments you have just read were repeated over and over again. And that helped me, eventually, to reconstruct what was going on in Mr Candy's mind. The other sheet of paper contains Mr Candy's disconnected thoughts in black ink mm. uh, and my attempt at connecting them together in red. Ah. Read through it and see what you think. Mr Franklin Blake is clever and agreeable, but he wants taking down a peg when he talks of medicine. I see. He confesses that he's been suffering from want of sleep at night. I tell him that his nerves are out of order and that he ought to take medicine. He tells me that taking medicine and groping in the dark are one and the same thing. Mr Jennings, this is unbelievable. This is exactly the conversation I had with Mr Candy at dinner that night. <laughs> Go on with the reading, Mr Blake. I'll show him a thing or two. 
He really wants sleep, and Lady Verinder's medicine chest is at my disposal. Give him five and twenty minims of laudanum tonight, without his knowing it, and then call tomorrow morning. How did you sleep last night, Mr. Blake? Like a log, he'll say. So much for medicine. And then come down on him with the truth. Mr. Jennings, does, does this mean that somehow or other Mr. Candy contrived to give me opium that night? Yes, he did. I don't think there can be any doubt about that. But how? I don't remember taking any medicine. Isn't there anything about it in your notes? Uh, nothing at all. Mr. Candy made no mention of it. The interfering, meddling old fool! Try to forgive him, Mr. Blake. He acted innocently enough. He's not the first doctor to practice a little deception on a patient. You certainly needed sleep. And he saw you got it. I think I might well have done exactly what Mr. Candy did. Are you saying that, in your opinion, as a medical man, I was acting under the influence of opium when I took the diamond? Yes. That is precisely what I think. In your overwrought condition, with the safety of the diamond uppermost in your mind, you went to where it was kept and took it. You were in a state of trance produced by the opium. <sighs> and for a whole year I've been wrestling with this... For a whole year, Rachel Verner has thought I was a thief and a hypocrite. And it's all Mr Candy's doing. But if he hadn't fallen ill, he would have called the next day. Told you of the trick he'd played on you. Miss Verinder would have heard of it and questioned him. And everything would have been cleared up straight away. Everything except what I'm supposed to have done with the diamond. And where it is now. Hmm. Those questions I can't answer. But there is one way I think I can help you. You and I know you didn't steal the diamond. Yes. Uh, at least that you didn't steal it with malice or forethought. But Miss Verinder doesn't. Perhaps I could prove to her that you did. <sighs> if only you could. It's almost more important to me than getting the diamond back. Mr Blake, mm. would you agree to taking part in a medical experiment? <sighs> what sort of experiment? One in which we try to recreate as exactly as possible the circumstances of last year. You go back to the house, you give up smoking. You get irritable, you sleep badly. And then I give you another dose of opium and we see what happens. You mean we see if I try and steal the diamond again? Yes. But it would never work. How could it? That is not a scientific answer, Mr Blake. The experiment will certainly not work if it is not tried. It may work if it is tried. How badly do you want to clear your name in Miss Verinder's eyes? Very well, Mr Jennings. I agree. When do we begin? This very moment. Put that cigar out, Mr Blake. It is your last for some time. That was part five of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Brian Gear. The cast, Gabriel Betteridge, John Sharp, Franklin Blake, John Telfer, Rachel Verinder, Sally Baxter, Rosanna Spearman, Tammy Eustinoff, Penelope Betteridge, Josie Kidd, Mr Bruff, Nat Brenner, Ezra Jennings, Philip Sully and Mr Candy, Danny Schiller. The music was composed and conducted by Sidney Sager and the programme, which came from Bristol, was directed by Brian Miller.